Henry, and he worked in mills his whole life. First in Eastern Europe with his father, they were from Germany, then he came across the Atlantic to America when he was 19 years old, eventually settling in Waterford in the year 1877. He married my mother, Emily Tram, in 1878, and I was born a few months later, coincidentally, or not, on October 26th, 1878. 129 years ago today. Thank you very much. Well, in the milling business, you move from town to town, and that's what my family did. We moved away from Waterford to a place called Lime Springs, Iowa, where my father worked as a miller. But like many of you know, there's just something about Northfield that brings people back to it. And it did that for us too. We came back in the mid-1890s where my father worked... Milling? In the milling business, that's correct. At the Ames Mill to be exact, where he was a manager there. I was in my mid-teens at the time and I was sick and tired of hanging on the mills. I knew there had to be something else out there. So I decided to spend my days at the Fox and Ferris Foundry where a guy was developing, and even the dead can get a little tongue-tied, he was developing a single cylinder slide valve steam engine. What exactly is a single cylinder slide valve steam engine? I didn't know, but I was going to find out. And I did. I spent my days at the Fox and Ferris Foundry working out the parts, seeing how they all worked, how they all functioned together, and it got me the idea of creating a horseless carriage using a steam-powered engine. Why a horseless carriage? Well, let me tell you. I love to hunt and fish. At one time, I was even president of the Northfield Gun Club. But any time I would travel, there'd be a horse and carriage in front of me. They'd be kicking up the dirt. You know, we didn't have asphalt back in those days. It was dirt, literally. So I got to thinking there had to be a way to get from point A to point B without those darn horses making me eat their dust all the time. Got a little old. So I go and I work at Fox and Ferris here and see how they develop it. I, I en ended up creating a, a uh, triangle chassis car, which would be a one wheel in front, and two wheels on the side like this. Now, I used my steam engine for it, didn't work. Did not work at all. Steam engine's out, let's throw it away. I sold the steam engine to somebody and got a few bucks for it. It got me the idea of developing a gasoline-powered engine. Where did the idea for gasoline come from? Well, it wasn't from me. There was people all over the country doing this. I'm not about to say I created it. But the unique thing about my story is that in Northfield here, nobody else was doing it. I was 17, I had no money, and absolutely no help. I even found out about it randomly one day by looking in a magazine at the Ames Mill where my father worked and I saw a gasoline powered engine there. I'm like, okay, is there anything like that in this area? And there was at the Stanton elevator. <coughs> so I took a little trip out to Stanton, got behind a horse and carriage, <laughs> coughing, wheezing the whole time. I'm like, gosh, I really got to create this thing. So I go to the Stanton elevator and they do have a steam powered gas engine. Thing weighed a ton, 2,000 pounds, gigantic. Well, I don't need something that big, but it gave me the idea to create something a little bit smaller under the same concept. You have to understand at this time though, the townspeople were calling me a fool, an idiot, stupid. Link, what are you doing? This is not gonna work. Even my own father got on that bandwagon and said, you're wasting your time, you should be in school. Remember folks, I was 17 and only entering eighth grade. Yeah, yeah, I graduated from high school when I was 21. But there were two people, two people that encouraged me to go on. My mother, Emily, and my little brother, Frank. And now let me tell you about Frank. This kid was something because of the fact that as a little brother, he was tagging along all the time, asking me questions, wanting to do what I do, and it got a little annoying at times. But this young guy would go around town and mow lawns, do odd jobs, anything he could do to scrounge together as many pennies as he could. And he would give this money to me to allow me to pursue my dream of creating a gasoline-powered horseless carriage. And I thank him every day for that, because not many people would have done it. My little brother did. That's family at its finest, if you ask me. So we go, and it's the winter of 1898. I have my triangle chassis vehicle with my gasoline-powered engine, but this thing was inferior. It, it was a piece of junk. It just didn't work, okay? It was in the wintertime. We actually had to drive the thing into snow banks to stop. We had no brakes. Well, okay, I was going to modify it a little bit, but a man from New Prague came and offered me $65 for it. Perfect, 65 bucks. I'll take it. You can have it. That helped me build my second car, the one that I received a little bit of notoriety for. 
The second car now had four wheels. It was still going to be gasoline powered, but I had the mold. I had everything figured out, so it didn't really take a lot to build. I built it, and it was the winter of 1898. A beautiful starlit sky, snow glistening in the moonlight, very peaceful, quiet, and serene. But not for long, because my little brother Frank and I, we go down to Bridge Square at the fountain there. We fill up the water tank of this vehicle, and we have a lantern for a headlight, and we're hoping, we're hoping it's going to work. And all of a sudden it goes, gung, 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 it works! It works! Oh, hallelujah! The people in the town said it couldn't happen, but it did. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we drove that horse's carriage around town for three consecutive hours from midnight <laughs> to 3 a.m. without stopping. And we were loud and no, oh, it was great. Oh, we loved it. Whole time Frank and I were cheering like crazy. And there was nothing sweeter than seeing the townspeople's faces the next day and everybody asking each other, what was that song last night? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Frank and I are right down there, and we're laughing. We're like, you said we couldn't do it, and we did it. That was our car. That was our horse's carriage doing that. I worked on this horse's carriage for a few, few more years, eventually sold it to a man named Fred Bates. Fred owned a bicycle shop in downtown Northfield, presently where Hodgepodge K is located. He sold it for $170. I sold, he, I, he bought it for me for $170. I took this money and started to develop my third car. Now this third car was going to be a three-speed with reverse transmission. Whoa, going backwards. Big deal, really. Back in those days it was. So we go, but this whole time I'm building this car, this whole time I still have my asthma trouble. I go to Denver for a year, and as I'm in Denver, I'm working as a mechanic. I don't find a cure for the asthma. I come back to Northfield, continue to work a little bit here and there. Okay, I go back to Los Angeles. I'm there for a couple of years, do a little work, and I study automotive design. That gave me the idea to come up for my, with my fourth car, a four-cylinder air-cooled engine. Pretty cool to put that on a car. My third car was still in production. I start building my fourth car. I got some ideas from around town. Worked with this guy named Henry Meacham, who was doing the same thing, air-cooled engines for farm equipment. Not for cars, for farm equipment. But eventually, money ran out. Even Frank, who worked in an orchestra and also worked at the Ames Mill and still giving me his paycheck so I could pursue my dream, that just wasn't enough. So I had to sell cars three and four to a Minneapolis firm. I was out of the car business, but I'd like to think that I put a little bit of of a niche in the automotive history. And it happened right here in my hometown of Northfield. That's pretty cool. So I get out of the car making business and I do a few odd jobs here and there. I sell the Mitchell automobile for a couple of years out of Minneapolis. And then I go and I rent a, some space in the central block and try to establish an industry there. That didn't really work out. So finally I came to work for the Hudson Essex car company where I sold cars out of my garage. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a car salesman. I'm a mechanic. I want to build the cars. I don't want to sell them. Somebody else can do that. I want to build the cars. So what I ended up doing the rest of my days was working as a freelance mechanic around Northfield here, and that was pretty cool doing that. Now, you might notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I have not mentioned a wife and kids this whole time because there was no wife and kids. I never married. I passed away on September 18, 1956. I spent the last month of my life at the Odd Fellows home and had my funeral at Northfield Methodist Church. So now I'm left to ponder why the Northfield Historical Society invited me to participate in these cemetery stories. And here's what I came up with. I'd like to think that maybe, just maybe, in the 152 year history of this town, I was able to put just a little bit of a footprint on that rich history. And I'd like to think and hope that maybe just maybe all of you out there can do the same. Follow your dreams because they can come true. It did for me. My name is Lincoln Fay, and that's my story. Woo! All right, Link.